So we are uh, in the season of Advent. We um, made a few adjustments. We're going to be wrapping up, um, cha- uh, wrapping up our study in the book of Esther this morning. Um, I did have a full-scale Advent series that I was planning on starting today. Pastor Jerry completely messed that up for me last week. Not that I'm complaining too much. It was good to have him back here this morning and uh, sharing, uh, sharing the gospel, sharing the good news of God's love with us last week. So that was good. That was a joy, um, I think, for all of us and even for me. But we are going to wrap up Esther this morning. Morning. That's okay. I didn't have to make too many adjustments because really this last part of Esther that we're looking at, this last half of chapter 9 and all of chapter 10, all three verses of it, um, it, uh, it was always intended to set us up for going into Advent. And it does that actually quite nicely, really. So where we've been... Let me actually, let me go ahead and pray real quick before I get too carried away. Let's go ahead and pray for God's, time, God's blessing over our study this morning and over his word with us. And then we'll uh, go ahead and uh, wrap this bad boy up. Heavenly Father, Lord, pray that you open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds, Lord, that we may be, that we may hear, that we may understand, that we may be transformed by your word and by your message for us this morning. For the good news, the promise, the expectation, anticipation of Purim, but also of Advent. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So 12 weeks ago, we kicked off, and we kicked off Esther. 12 weeks ago. It's been a little bit of a long, a long bout. It's, uh, it's not the easiest book to get through. It's a challenging book, really, for anybody. We have noted before that Esther is one of these books that there have been a lot of people, a lot of smart people who are way smarter than me in the past, who we oftentimes look for, for our own guidance when it comes to how we read the Bible and what we understand about God and our theology and all that, who have actually just flat out said, you know what, this book doesn't even belong in our Bible. It doesn't even belong there. It doesn't talk about God. It seems to be all about Judaism and and, and Israel. I mean, why do we have this in the Christian Bible? And we wrestle with that, and people have wrestled and struggled with that for a long time. But as we've seen, as we've gone through this, is that God is not completely silent, even though he's never mentioned, even though he's never specifically or explicitly stated and named in these pages, God is not silent. His fingerprints are all over this story. They're everywhere. They're in the details. They're in the words. They're in the phrasing and the ideas, the memories and and the concepts that are invoked in the way this story is told, and you just can't really get away from him. He's there. So 12 weeks ago, we kicked off and we started off by looking right at the very beginning of the story. We saw Xerxes, you know, really exerting his power and emphasizing his power and his authority and control that he has over the world, over the known world at that time. He throws this massive banquet. And he's, he's basically showing off. He's saying, look, everybody, look how big I am. Look how powerful I am and how strong I am. I can throw this huge party. Nobody's going to attack me. My money and my resources, my wealth is unlimited. I can do whatever I want. And in the course of that banquet, we saw his queen at that time, Queen Vashti, who decided to make her own power play, who decided to exert her own influence, her own attempt at trying to take control of the situation in a public way by showing all Xerxes' guests that she can control Xerxes simply by saying no, simply by refusing to do what Xerxes wanted her to do. And so so Vashti at that point, as a result of that disobedience, as a result of that resistance, is dethroned. She's she's removed from her position. She's no longer the queen. That's been stripped away from her. And then we saw shortly after that that, you know, as a result of really this failed war that Xerxes attempted between he and Greece to finally take over and annex Greece, the, the, the territory of Greece. You know, it was all a bunch of city-states at that time rather than an official country. But his attempt to try and take over that, that area, that region, and it just completely failed. It was a total disaster, and the Persian Empire was thrown into chaos. And in an effort to try and quell that chaos, to try and to bring some peace back to things, he decided to go and find a new queen because everybody likes a queen and if you have a queen you could throw another party and everybody likes a party so that's what he decides to do and he comes across and and he he appoints this this jewish girl by the name of esther to become his new queen and all of a sudden you know not necessarily all of a sudden but seems things seem to really kind of calm down and settle down after that. But it's not long after that that we are then introduced to Mordecai, 
who becomes probably the most central figure, quite honestly, in this story, you know, in terms of a human character in this story. And we're, we're introduced to Mordecai, who is Esther's cousin, and simply by refusing to bow down to another man by the name of Haman, Mordecai launches and kicks up, you know, relaunches this whole, you know, really old ancient rivalry that existed between Haman and his tribe, his people, known as the Amalekites, and Mordecai's people, the Israelites. And we have this subplot that starts to take shape and starts to take root and take form as being a a pretty significant point and part of the story of Esther as it unfolds and as we see God working in this story. So God's never mentioned this book. I mentioned that. God's never mentioned in this book. And some people in the past have said that because of that, we shouldn't even have this book in the Christian Bible anymore. But God's fingerprints are all over the story, and you can't escape that. And what's even interesting about this is that the way in which this story is written, sort of the point of view that this story takes is from the perspective of a group of people who are constantly struggling in this historical context in the midst of these events, constantly struggling with whether or not God is even at work in their lives, whether or not God is there, whether or not God cares. And maybe what's even worse is they're just downright feeling that God has completely abandoned them. He's forgotten them. He left them back in Israel. When they were taken out of Israel, out of Jerusalem, God left the building. He's gone. He's nowhere to be seen. And so we have a group of people who are feeling like they've been completely abandoned by this God who they believed was always going to be there for them. The book of Esther is um, it's kind of classified as a historical book as a historical book. It's kind of in the same category when you look at the Old Testament. It's kind of in the same category as a book like Genesis or maybe Joshua, for example. It tells a story, and it tells a formative story that helps us understand better who was Israel, who are God's people, and what is God at work doing in the life of his people. We look at the story, and we look at some of these other stories, and we look at them as, these are, you know, I mean, they, maybe they've been elaborated on. Maybe they've been kind of changed and tweaked to make certain points or whatever over the years, but in any case, We can read these stories with a certain amount of confidence that this is what happened. This is a real account of how God worked in the lives of his people. And we take that and we trust that and we rest in that. And when it comes to the story of Esther, what we're really getting at is the history of a feast of Purim. The history of the Feast of Purim, that is really where this story is kind of directing us in so many ways. All the way back in chapter 1, it's pushing us along as we go along with it. It's pushing us along to get to where we are today. This is what this is all about. This is how Jews, this is how the Israelites got the, the Feast of Purim. Purim is interesting. Purim is kind of a funny thing because it wasn't laid out. It wasn't established by God. You look at, you know, all these Jewish feasts and festivals and celebrations and holidays and everything else that Jews have in the Old Testament. All this stuff is laid out by God. God comes along and he says, look, people, look, you're my people. I'm your God. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to do this thing that we're now going to call Passover. And I want you to do this thing that, you know, this thing we call the Feast of Tabernacles. And we have the, you know, Yom Kippur, um, which is the Day of Atonement, you know, kind of separate, you know, represents, you know, me saving you and, 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 and washing away your sins and all this kind of stuff. We have, you, you have all these things that I want you to do, these festivals, these, out, these celebrations, these, these feasts that I want you to celebrate and to keep celebrating as a means of pointing you back to me and what I'm doing. But now along comes Purim, and Purim doesn't fit that category. See, Purim wasn't established by God. Purim, in many ways, it's, it's, more, like, it's more like Israel just kind of celebrating their own existence. At least that's sort of the way it starts. It's kind of what, what, what seems to be going on there. Now, I've been comparing Purim a little bit to sort of the idea of Thanksgiving with us. Because I think the two are actually pretty similar in how they came about and what they're attempting to do. And the reason I say is, so Purim was this completely secular, nationalistic holiday for Israel. And in many ways, Thanksgiving, when it was established, when it was first set up and originated, it was originated and established as this secular, non-religious day for America at giving thanks. But Thanksgiving is also really wrapped up in a lot of this, these religious beliefs and these religious roots that we have. And Purim has a lot of the same similar kind of aspects and characteristics to it for Jews also. It's not entirely secular. 
So Thanksgiving for us is a lot about our American identity. How did we become Americans? What does that mean? And so we tell these stories and we watch, what is it, Charlie Brown's Thanksgiving or something, and we hear these stories about the pilgrims coming across on, on these three ships and setting up, you know, setting up three ships. Now I'm getting confused with Columbus. Uh, <laughs> woo! Okay, anyways. So the pilgrims are coming across on the Mayflower and they set up shop in Massachusetts and it's all about religious freedom and, and getting away from the Church of England. No offense, Graham. Um, or Anne's not even here, so I can't pick on Anne. Anne, Anne, no offense, Anne. Anyways, you know, it's all about the pilgrims getting away from the Church of England and looking for religious freedom. And so they come here and they set up this, this free country and that kind of lays down these roots for how we understand ourselves as Americans and what our American identity is. And Purim has the same kind of effect, excuse me, the same kind of effect for Jews. It gives them a sense of who they are and their identity as Israelites and Jews. But it's very wrapped up for us. Thanksgiving is very wrapped up for us in this idea of thankfulness as something that we do and direct at God. And so there are these religious connotations that come into Thanksgiving for us, just like there are religious connotations that come into Purim for Israel. And this is where we're going this morning. Purim has the ability to bring the secular and the sacred together in a way that it really isn't seen all that clearly in the Old Testament up until this point. And that's big. That's huge, especially as we go into this season of Advent. Let's take a look at our verses now. I'm going to stop talking. Let's just go ahead and take a look at our verses or our text. Um, Esther chapter 9, verse 20 is where we're going to start looking this morning. I'm just going to go ahead and read all the way through, um, all the way to the end of the book here. Esther chapter 9, beginning at verse 20. So Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned to joy, and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote them, to observe the days as days of feasting and joy, and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the poor, that is, the lot, for their ruin and destruction. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his sons should be impaled on poles. Therefore, these days were called Purim and the, from the word poor because of everything written in the letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it on themselves to establish the custom they had, that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants." So Queen Esther, daughter of Abihel, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of Xerxes' kingdom, words of goodwill and assurance, to establish these days of Purim at their designated times, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them, and, they, and as they had established for themselves and their descendants in regard to their times of fasting and lamentation. Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Purim, and it was written down in the records. So King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire to its distant shores, and all his acts of power and might, together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted, are they not written in the book of the annals of the king of Med kings of Medea and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews, and held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. So one of the lingering questions that's kind of been hanging out there as we've gone through this story is this question of who exactly is Esther? Is Esther going to identify? What is her identification? Where is she going to come down? Is she going to be Persian or is she going to be uh, Hebrew? Is she going to be Israelite? Is she going to be Jewish? And where does she come down? And we kind of had a little bit of a hint of that back when she was finally, back when she finally got talked into going to Xerxes and reviewing and re, re, re ugh, man, I'm going to have issues today. Holy cow. Uh, revealing 
her identity to King Xerxes, that she was in fact Jewish, but then there's still this question of, is she going to stay openly Jewish, or is she going to sort of retreat back into her Persian identity and continue to be known as Esther rather than by her Jewish name, Hadassah? And now we get here, verse 29, I think, kind of finally sets that or puts that question at peace in verse 29. So Queen Esther, her Persian name, daughter of Abihel, her Jewish mother. She has gotten herself to a point of saying, you know what? I don't have to pick one or the other. I don't have to be either Jewish or Persian. I don't have to keep this separation here. I can be both. I can do both at the same time. And that idea, that, real, that, that realization, that precedence that Esther sets here, that, that is, that, that's, that, that's mind-boggling, quite honestly, for the Old Testament. This idea that you don't have to pick one or the other, but you can actually be both. This idea of bringing the two together. See, up until Esther, and I wish that, I wish that these ancient Israelites, that they would have carried on with this pattern. It would have saved them a lot of headaches when it got to Jesus and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, but that just didn't happen and work out that way. But what Esther does here, is she sits here, she comes along and she says, you know what, it's okay. And up until this time, prior to Esther, if you were an Israelite, you had to be Jewish. If you were Persian, you had to be whatever the national religion of Persia was going to be. Probably something like Zoroastrianism, which is some weird kind of funky thing that we don't even want to get into right now. Um, Or at the best, simplest, maybe even just simply king worship or Xerxes worship, you know, in some ways could have been the other national religion for, for Persia at that time. But at the time, it was just assumed that if you're a citizen of a certain kingdom or country, you had to adhere to their religion. Esther comes along and she says, no, I am Persian, but I'm also Jewish. She brings these two together. And now for us, you know, for, for us, for Christians who kind of fall into this Reformed tradition, that is not necessarily as mind-boggling or mind-blowing as what it may be for some other Christian traditions or even for the, uh, the Jews and the Persians at this time either because we have this, this long-standing tradition. We have this, this deeply rooted understanding that, you don't, that not everything has to be divided out into secular and sacred. We do actually combine it. We do have this understanding, a very healthy understanding, I think, that our faith does affect and it does work itself into everything. So you can go out, you can be a public school teacher, you can be a garbage man, you can be a financial advisor, you can be a banker, you can be a police officer, or you can be a minister, or you can work for a Christian nonprofit, and it doesn't matter. Your faith works in and it affects everything you do. We're okay and comfortable with that. But they weren't so much. This is different for them. And we look at that and we can kind of follow that out and extrapolate that and look at those, those implications of everything that that brings into it. And that's a very big topic that really we just can't get into right now. But it is just at least noteworthy and interesting and worth pointing out that Esther has found her identity. And she has said, it's okay. It's okay. We can do both because God is working out in every aspect and facet of our life. And our faith does affect all those different facets. So that's probably that last big question that's kind of hanging out there. The verses I really want to focus in on this morning are actually at the very beginning of our text, starting in verse 20 again. So Mordecai recorded these events, and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and a mourning into a day of celebration. Rest, relief, deliverance. What we're being told here, flat out and point blank, is that Purim is all about getting to that point of rest and relief from their enemies. I'm going to go outside of our text a little bit. I'm still in the book of Esther. Um, Flip back with me for a second, back to chapter 4. Back to chapter 4, verse 14. Probably the second most famous and second, yeah, probably the second most popular verse and phrase and statement out of the book of Esther. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 14 says this. 
For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. So this is Mordecai talking to Esther. Mordecai is, at this point is trying to convince Esther to go to Xerxes, reveal who she is, and save the Jews. And she, he flat out says, look, Esther, you might not do it, but know this, that if you don't do this, relief and deliverance for the Jews are going to come from a different place. And we talked about those verses, and I even talked about it, and I went back and checked my old sermons to make sure I did promise this. I promised at that time that we were going to come back to this because this is key and you look at that and that's the first time you see this idea of rest and relief then you go back over to chapter 9 and throughout the entirety of chapter 9 we're only looking at the last half but throughout the entirety of chapter 9 this hebrew word for rest and relief that's used in verse in chapter 4 comes up four times in the course of chapter 9 all in relation to look this is what happened here this is the theological significance of this secular event god gave his people rest and relief. And he uses the word, he uses the Hebrew word noach, which means exactly that, rest, relief. And yes, it is tied into the name Noah. It's a little bit different, but it's a variation. It's very much related. We have this emphasis and this point blank statement that says this is what it's all about and this is what God is doing in the story of Esther. He's getting his people, he's making good, he's carrying out his covenant faithfulness, and he's bringing rest and relief from Israel, to Israel, from their enemies, from the evil of the world. There's two aspects of this word, noach, two aspects of this word that are really pretty important, nuances of this word that are really pretty important for us as it plays into here. And one is that it literally refers to this idea of peace and quiet. Noah, arrest, relief, deliverance, literally refers to this idea of peace and quiet. So you think about this, you know, and I don't know how many of your kids are like ours, but you all have seen our kids, you know what our kids are like. The best time of the day for me, outside of that half hour I get between getting up and them waking up, is when they go to bed. Okay, only a few of your parents are kind of laughing. I thought that would go over a little bit better. Okay. The best time of the day is when the kids go to bed because it's quiet, it's silent, there's peace from all the, the chaos and the fighting and the, the, the toys being thrown all over the place and the kids not getting along and, and us you know, getting to the point of pretty much yelling at the kids because the kids aren't listening to you. you know, for those of you who are teachers, I'm sure you understand this too. You know, at the end of the day, when the kids go home and you're just sitting in your classroom, you get to that point where the kids are in bed, they're asleep or at least not making any noise, not coming in and out all the time and you're getting up and down. You get to that point where you just sit on the couch and it's just, oh, the TV's not on. The music isn't on. You're not talking to anybody. You're just sitting there dwelling in the peace and quiet of the house. And then you turn the TV on to your favorite show and you pass out on the couch, right? Because that's the way it all works. Peace and quiet, and it's heavenly to get to that point in the day, you know. It's great. That's kind of that first sense of this word noach, noach. The other sense that kind of plays into this is that noach had come to be understood as a theological word that referred to the final Sabbath. The final Sabbath. Now, um, you know, the Sabbath, we kind of talk about this in Christian terms. You know, today is a Sabbath. Sunday is a Sabbath. When I was growing up, Sundays, I I hated Sundays. I didn't like going to church because church to me was just boring. So I didn't want to go. I didn't want to do anything or be there. But the other part of it is that I just wasn't allowed to do anything after church got out. So I'd go home and then my dad would take a nap and I'd be like, okay, well, now what? I'm bored. It was horrid. I mean, I would have even done homework on Sunday just to give me something to do, but I wasn't allowed to do anything or do anything because it's, sa- it's, a su- it's Sunday. It's a Sabbath. It's a day of rest. You take a break from your normal work. I've now gotten to the point where I love, sa- I love my Sabbath, which is actually Saturday rather than Sunday because I'm always working on Sunday. Um, but I, I, I got to the point where I love taking Sabbath because it's a break from the chaos of the week. And these ancient Jews, and Jews even till today, they see it this way. The Sabbath is a holy day. It's a protected day. You don't work. You don't do any activity. And even depending on what sort of Jew you are, because there's different denominations in there, just like there are with Christians, some of the most conservative Jews, they won't even turn on a light switch 
on the Sabbath because they protect it that much. They won't do anything. They see it as this time where they can fully break and separate from the chaos of life and really get rest and relief. And when Jews, ancient Jews, um, especially when they would think about the Messiah and when the Messiah would come and what the Messiah would do, they would think of it in terms of a Sabbath. We get these images in our head of heaven being, you know, a never-ending golf game where you always hit par or every hole is a hole in one maybe. I don't know. You know, or it's a never-ending base baseball game where it's a never ending just time to just sit around and hang with family or whatever it may be. We get these pictures in our head of what heaven is going to be like. And these ancient Jews, their picture of heaven was a never ending, perfect, eternal Sabbath that was just one big, massive feast that the Messiah throws. And you never have to worry about going back to work ever again. Doesn't that sound great? I know that sounds, that sounds like a great thing to me sometimes. All right. That's what, that was the picture that these Jews had of what the Messiah would bring in and what that ultimate Sabbath would look like. And this word noach of rest and relief and deliverance pictured and looked ahead to that final ultimate Sabbath of ultimate perfect never ending rest. It was a break from the chaos of the world and the brokenness of the world around them. So Purim... It's sort of the Jewish version of Thanksgiving and working our way now, getting into the season of Advent. Purim was very much, even though a sec- it was a secular holiday for them, was very much, much wrapped up in the theological aspects of that final Sabbath and final rest. And while they would look at, their mo- at that moment and that situation of being saved from Haman's curse, so to speak, and getting that relief in the immediate from their enemies, they also saw it as a time of anticipation, looking ahead of what was still coming. And so they celebrated. And they will celebrate and celebrate and celebrate without end. And they will give praise to God and they will thank God. And they will live in that constant state of anticipation of that messianic Sabbath that they look forward to. Advent is a season of anticipation. And last week, I thought it was great, probably one of the greatest lines I've ever heard from any minister. When Pastor Jerry was up and he said, you know, Advent is one of probably the hardest time of the year for ministers. So there's only so many times you can say, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he came, he's here, he came, or he came, he's here, whatever it was that he said. You know, you kind of get into, get locked into that. But when we sit here and we think as Christians, well, what exactly are we anticipating now as we move toward Christmas and as we move into Advent? And we're not, because Jesus already came, the Messiah came, what is there to anticipate? We still, like the Jews, have this ability to anticipate that final Sabbath that we are still waiting for and expecting and living expectantly for. We have that promise. We have that show that this is real. We have that show in the birth of Christ, in his death, in his resurrection, that promise that we have within us that our salvation, our faith is real. And yet we still live in anticipation that this isn't done yet. God is still working. God is still working this stuff out. We still have more, the best thing, the best Sabbath to look forward to. And anticipation builds. And it builds and it, and it develops. And every time we turn on the news and we see the brokenness of the world, we see, we see things like Ferguson. We see things like, like ISIS. We see the brokenness of the world around us. We look at our own lives and our own broken relationships. And ideally, we are given the opportunity to remember and anticipate again that Sabbath, that final Sabbath that we are still waiting for, that is still coming, that we still know is on its way. Israel celebrated victory over their enemies. There's also a celebration of the anticipation of victory over the brokenness of the world, namely their sin. And as we move into Advent, this is in the main ways where we make that turn then from Esther, from Thanksgiving, from Purim, over to Advent. As we move into, as we make that turn, we also come, it also comes with this reminder and this emphasis on God's covenant faithfulness to us, to the season of Advent, the season of anticipation, which begins today. This anticipation of Advent began at the fall. Maybe you've been wondering what all these different boards and everything like that are around. It begins at the fall with a tree. 
a tree in which Adam and Eve were given one command, one lousy command, just keep your hands off of it, keep your grubby hands off of it and off its fruit. And they couldn't follow that command. And instead they were hungry and they simply reached up and grabbed that fruit off of that tree. And it turned this tree of life, this tree of knowledge of good and evil, and it turned it into a dead tree, one that we'd be inclined to cut down and throw into the fire. And thus began this process of anticipation because after that failure, after that fall, after the perfection of creation was broken for a piece of fruit, God made a promise to fix it. 